And we are good. So why don't you take us away? All right, then. Let's take it to, take it from the top. Can we all see my screen? Yep, I see it. Yep. With it. So, hello, hello, hello. Oh, my God. First gaff. But, hello, welcome to this talk uh, about cloud native development with Java on the Quarkus platform, Red Hat's latest and greatest offering in the crowded microservice space. There are a ton of microservice frameworks, but that's what's going to knock your socks off. So, a little bit about me, self promotional, a little bit. Hello, my name is Tayo Koliosho. I'm a technical lead by day and moonlight as a consulting architect, uh, literally by night. And I'm an author for LinkedIn Learnings or Linda. I do a ton of stuff, or I used to do a ton of stuff on Stack Overflow when I'm in, I'm in, I'm still in the top 2%. And uh, you can reach me at tayo.coliosho at 100%solutions.com. Uh, any questions, thoughts, or concerns? No? Lovely. Because if you had concerns about me or my name, I, I don't know what to do with that. So, Java says, or Java used to say, write once, run anywhere. Wara. Are we all familiar with this? First of all, we, are we all Java engineers here, or who's not, a, who's not familiar with Java? Ah, all right. So uh, Java, you know, object-oriented programming language, run on 3 billion devices. Their bread and butter was that you could write a Java application on one computer and it would run everywhere. What they don't tell you though, is that the capability to do that comes at a price. For one thing, for you to be able to do that, your application will have to lug around a gigantic, OS agnostic, but not really JVM, a virtual machine. It's an insulated environment within which your code will run. Uh, that, that obviously is a ton of bloat for you to pad yourself and mitigate cross OS uh, differences. You're going to have to have a, several layers of fat in there to prevent any uh, contamination. It also comes to what I call the take your time interpreter. So, Instead of taking your source files straight to machine instructions, there's an intermediate step called the Java bytecode uh, construct class files. These are then at runtime uh, converted on the spot to uh, machine instructions. So you can imagine instead of going straight from source code to machine code, every single time you have to run Java code, it first has to take that intermediate, intermediate step. It takes a lot longer than it sounds. But over time, Java blessed us with the just-in-time compiler, which after the Take Your Time interpreter has done its thing a couple thousand cycles of your code run, it will then decide, you know what, maybe I should compile this you know, Java class into machine code. That's what we get with write once, run anywhere. Now, also in the Java ecosystem, uh, Sundi, have you heard of Spring or the Spring framework? Right, so we've got Spring, we've got Jakarta EE, and one of the biggest value offerings that they offer are, is dependency injection. You're welcome. So the dependency injection pattern is basically uh, a mechanism by which you can be supplied things by the programming runtime. So gone are the days where if you wanted a database connection, you have to do all the heavy lifting, or if you wanted to talk to a web service, you have to set up a bunch of gear. A dependency injection platform will give those things to you at the point where you need them. The problem is you get everything, what you need and what you don't need. That's what dependency injection or modern dependency injection frameworks offer. So you get all the dependencies you didn't want. Dependency injection also depends on, I know what I, I know there's a bit of redundancy there, but it depends on reflection, which is another job, it's Java speak for, you don't need to decide what you need upfront. When your code is about to execute, 
will help you decide. That's what reflection is in Java. So you have a lot of that going. And then, you know, specifically with Spring Framework, there's been the cloud native buzzword uh, flying around the industry lately. And, you know, a lot of frameworks are having to retrofit their platform to be quote unquote cloud native. But that's what I just call, uh, that's what I think, that's what I call the cloud afterthought. A lot of these frameworks were not engineered from the ground up to be cloud native. Why would they? The cloud did not really become popular until you know, the last couple of years. So it's cloud afterthought. A lot of the cloud native features that you get with uh, a lot of popular frameworks are um, bolt-ons, not as good as what is engineered from the ground up for the cloud. Just a second there, might be messaged. <laughs> right. And then, of course, memory hoggery. All of this stuff, all the dependencies you didn't want, all that reflection you didn't care, you, you, you don't know about, the cloud native afterthought, it comes at a price. Tons and tons of memory. A lot of dependency injection frameworks are hungry, hungry hippos for that sweet, sweet RAM. So, oops, sorry. In a world with Docker, a canned, reusable, repeatable operating system environment. Vagrant, a canned, reusable, repeatable desktop operating system environment. And the cloud containing canned, predictable, reusable operating system environments and componentry. In a world with all that stuff, what I like to call the right ones run predictably or warp, the warp world. Why do I need that layer of insulation from any programming platform? Why do I need to be kept guessing where my code is going to be deployed? I don't need to. Q Saint Bay. What I really need is to be able to write my code once, bake it into a Docker container, a vagrant image, and be on my way. To that end, we don't need Wara. What we do need, or rather what Java needs to do, is to go supersonic, subatomic with Quarkus. So what's Quarkus? Quarkus is a microservice, and FYI, I did not invent that. That literally is their tagline. It's the supersonic subatomic framework. That's their marketing lingo. So Quarkus is a microservice framework from Red Hat. It's, uh, was, it went version 1.0 in November uh, 2019. It's professionally supported by Red Hat, like you can hire them to help you with your Quarkus distribution or everything around it. They have a Red Hat uh, flavored Quarkus uh, distribution, different from the community edition. It's their, like, it's the jewel in the crown at this point. They're really pushing it. And it's a cloud native first platform, engineered from the ground up for the cloud. Not like strictly for the cloud, obviously you can deploy wherever you want, but everything that they put into it, every thought that they put into it, they want to, they, they're, they put all the extensions, all the features, all the uh, planning into it for the cloud environment. It's got competitors. It has Spring Boot. We all know Spring Boot from the Spring Framework run by Pivotal. It's got micro, uh, we have Micronaut, and then we've got Heladen. Heladen is a, uh, also another cloud native framework from Oracle. Started, uh, started as an internal project that they decided to, uh, to, uh, to open source and uh, pitch to the Java community. So features of Quarkus, it is serverless and container friendly. Again, engineered from the ground up for the cloud. So it has, and it's not just, oh, you can deploy Quarkus inside, the, inside a serverless uh, environment or in a container. It has extensions targeted at making it extremely easy to deploy to Kubernetes, Docker, Azure, uh, and Lambda, AWS's Lambda, and even GCP. The GCP a bit came fairly recently. Um, next, it's got what I believe many people will find very, very appealing about Quarkus. It's got native image support. Remember all that I was telling you earlier about how there's a ton of fat around traditional Java, there's all that insulation for right ones run anywhere. Native image support 
using Oracle's Graal VM uses, uh, employs what's known as ahead of time compilation. So what ahead of time compilation does is that it cuts down, it cuts away the interpretation step of Java. So it takes your code straight from your, you know, your source code to a machine, uh, so an OS dependent machine code executable. So for Windows, you can get an EXE straight from your Java package. Uh, for, for Linux or Linux flavored systems, you can get a Linux executable. And this comes with a ton of savings. I cannot uh, stress it enough. But off the top of my head, now Java can exist in form factors that we didn't dream was possible. You can have Java in embedded devices, microcontrollers, a host of form factors that wasn't an option for Java before. On the developer comfort side, we've got hot code reload. So while you're working in your favorite IDE, you don't need to restart your machine or restart your, uh, your server or anything of the sort to reflect new changes. Just keep working and keep uh, hitting your microservice with requests and it automatically picks up the new changes. Framework support. This I feel is a kill shot for the Spring Framework. Quarkus supports not just like standard Java EE specifications because it is built on a, uh, Java EE specifications. It supports the Spring Framework as well. So you can bring your Spring Beans, your Spring application, drop it in Quarkus and get instant uh, benefit from everything that Quarkus offers you. And that's alongside, like I said, it supports standards. Uh, Spring Framework is a little bit of a walled garden in that they pick and choose what open source standards they'll support. Uh, Quarkus is all in on the Jakarta EE slash Java EE specification, in addition to absorbing the Spring Framework and all that it's got to offer. Next up, reactive everything. Everything in Quarkus is reactive. And for those of you that aren't familiar, reactivity uh, fundamentally is about efficient use of CPU resources, specifically or especially in a multi-core system. Everything is reactive first. You have to go out of your way to disable the reactivity or to circumvent the reactivity. So you're talking about high throughput, high performing, high performing microservices when you build with the Quarkus framework. It's got a rich extension ecosystem. Also a shot across the bow for the Spring Framework. See, one of Spring Framework's you know, biggest claims to fame is their moat. The Spring Framework swears by everything that they provide in the ecosystem. If you want to connect to a Kafka broker, if you want to connect to uh, a database, you want to connect to AWS, they have a module for everything. Quarkus looked at that and said, I'll, raise, I'll see your, your framework support and raise you with the wonderful Apache Camel framework. I love Camel. Camel is an integration framework that provides, well, integration to pretty much everything that you can think of. Whatever it is that the Spring Framework supplies or offers, the Apache Camel Framework uh, supports it as well. So what the Camel uh, guys did was they forked off an entire branch of the Camel Framework dedicated to porting all of their extensions over to Quarkus. It's one of the reasons why like, Quarkus is a real threat to Spring right now. So, Whatever the Spring offers in terms of moat to differentiate themselves from other microservice frameworks in the, uh, uh, on the market, Quarkus blows all of that out of the water. Polyglot, you can, because of Graal VM, which uh, is an Oracle product, the specialty VM, you can program in Quarkus with Scala and Kotlin and more languages to come because Graal actually uh, supports also JavaScript and a bunch of different languages. But for now, Quarkus lets you write Scala and Kotlin code and still benefit from the native imagery and all that good stuff. So, native mode. Like I described earlier, native mode is how you strip away all of the fat that vanilla or traditional Java comes with. But really, how does it look by the numbers? So I'm talking about up to 900% less RAM. You are not going to find a better performing Java application 
anywhere. It doesn't exist. We're talking a thousand percent less CPU utilization and up to 81 times faster startup than JVM mode Quarkus. So a note here, native mode is not the only mode supported by Quarkus. You can run it as a vanilla uh, Java application with, as a jar file. And even that jar file still performs better than Spring Boot. It's hyper-optimized. Now, you take a hyper-optimized traditional Quarkus application, and then you compile that to native code, and you're talking about huge savings. Anyone who's worked in serverless here knows all about cold starts, how AWS bills you per CPU utilization, and also per RAM, uh, per, uh, per, uh, on the basis of RAM consumption. And if you consume more RAM, you'll automatically be billed for more CPU utilization. Quarkus is going to be the lowest cost uh, provider for applications in a serverless platform, aside from something like Go. Not even Python comes close, ladies and gentlemen. This is a game changer. My jaw dropped the first time that I ran a fully featured Quarkus application. I'm talking about uh, an application that contains, uh, you know, Hibernate, it contains, you know, uh, a REST web service. It has a bunch of stuff in it. And I could, the RAM utilization was ridiculously low relative to other uh, comparable applications. The CPU utilization barely registered when I was running top. And it started up in a fraction of a second. Cold starts will never be a problem if you're running Quarkus in serverless, specifically AWS Lambda. And that's it. If I sound like a nut for Quarkus, that's because I've written a book on Quarkus. You can find the book at apress, uh, apress.com. You can find it at amazon.com. Those are the links. And if you reach out to me, I can hook you up with a 20% discount. I was actually surprised that my publisher <laughs> signed up for that, but they gave me a discount code that I can share with uh, people that are interested in uh, a discount on the book. But I cannot speak the praises of Quarkus enough. It is, Java is dead, uh, long live Java. You wouldn't want to write Java in a different way once you start writing in native mode, specifically with Quarkus. Now, because we can't have nice things, a couple of problems. Well, not problems, uh, but things you should, be, uh, uh, you, you should be aware of. So, one of the things that I experienced while writing this book is that, and it really guided the way I wrote the book, is the, the framework developers, because of their proximity to the code, uh, they took certain things for granted. So Spring is currently the undisputed king of Java application development, especially in the microservice space. So the, enough people are unfamiliar with you know, Java EE and Jakarta EE standards like, you know, context and dependency injection and the various JSRs that form the Java EE platform. Uh, one of the problems I experienced with the official Quarkus docs is they didn't take any time to introduce people to fundamentals of Java EE and Jakarta EE, which, you know, bless them, their proximity to it, you know, must have been a blind side for them where they felt, well, everybody should know this, right? But that's one of the challenges that I faced with it. Next up, you know, native image compilation. That is taking your Java code to an EXE or a Linux executable can be time consuming because the process of native image uh, compilation requires the Graal, uh, Graal or the Graal VM uh, engine to walk the tree of every class you've written in Java and every class that that class depends on and so on. You need to be fairly explicit or rather GraalVM needs to be fairly explicit about what your application will need input it, uh, as a native image. That process is, it can be time consuming. It can be memory consuming. So from a DevOps perspective, you need to make sure that your Jenkins server, what have you, is sufficiently provisioned to expect, you know, uh, a build job to hold on a, to a thread or multiple threads uh, for, for north of an hour, because you're talking about trying to compile uh, a traditional fat jar that's like 200 to 300 meg. You're trying, trying to slim it down to 40 or 50 megabytes. So that can take some time. And then, you know, 
microservices. Everybody is taught and their grandmother is interested in microservices now. It's not for everyone. It's not for everything. Quarkus is not just for microservices, even though it's marketed that way. And even though my book is about microservices, but uh, you should understand that adopting Quarkus doesn't mean you must go with the microservice model. Choose what works for you. And besides microservice or monolith, there's a middle ground between there. You don't have to pick the extreme. And then Graal VM itself. Uh, may Larry Ellison be with all of us, but if you want the good stuff out of Graal VM, you're going to have to pay for commercial support, which I imagine is less than ideal for uh, many people. I mean, you don't have to, but there are certain features of Graal that I personally like uh, that you will have to pay for a commercial license for. Uh, I fully expect that to change uh, over the coming years because this is the future of Java. There is no need to write Java the way we do it today. It is going to die. So Red Hat has a, uh, has promised to build, to take their own fork of Graal VM and start supporting it for the open source community. So enough of that action will go around wherein I, I imagine the commercial license thing will naturally fade away. But for now, if you want like any of the advanced garbage collectors, if you want some advanced instr instrumentation like a, the Java flight recorder, you're going to have to pay for a commercial license. But overall, for 80, 85% of adopters of GraalVM and uh, Quarkus, you will never, you probably won't be dealing with license issues anyway. It works out of the box almost all the time. Uh, so just that a little bit of a sanity checking there, even for me, uh, as much as I'd love, I'd love to shield this technology, it's not all you know, rainbow and skittles. And that's it. You can find me again at Tayo.colio show at 100%solutions.com. You can find me on LinkedIn Learning, uh, on LinkedIn and lynda.com. I actually have a course coming out in about three months on Java performance troubleshooting uh, for concurrency, uh, for latency and throughput, and data access and consistency in a multi thread environment. Two separate courses. I don't have a Twitter, Instagram, or blog because I'm lazy and disconnected. Uh, sorry about that. Questions, thoughts, or concerns? Yeah, thanks for that. Hey, uh, how much of the benefits of Quarkus come from Graal? Uh, you know, a lot of like the native compiling and stuff like that. Right. How much of it is, is Graal uh, specific? How much of it is what Quarkus gives you on top of it? I mean, I guess Quarkus gives you the reactivity. Mm. Yes, so Quarkus, it's about a 50-50 split. Graal gives you the native imagery which gives you, uh, you know, the very small images and uh, the uh, nimbleness when you, uh, and the small form factor. Quarkus on its own, so one of the things, for example, Quarkus, when it's starting up, it goes through your list of beams. Uh, my Spring Framework folk would, would know what I'm talking about, but it, without Graal, without native imagery, it strips memory of stuff you don't need. So one of the things you get from Spring Framework, for example, is it's hauling the entire forest for you when you might need just a tree. The Quarkus team, they built, uh, you know, a cleanup job that as you're starting up, it's checking, do you need this? And you can, if you enable debug level logging, for example, you can see, you know, clearing things up. People have done a side, the problem is a side-by-side -side comparison with of Quarkus versus Spring, for example, is not, it's kind of difficult to repeat the results, but on its own, with, without Graal, Quarkus is lighter. It's lighter weight. It has a richer ecosystem. It, you know, it supports a, a huge amount of frameworks. When you add Camel to it, I dare say Quarkus brings a lot more value in terms of like uh, framework support than the Spring framework. So without Graal, you can still have a good time with Quarkus. It's just, I wouldn't deploy Quarkus as a serverless application in the traditional Java model in JVM mode. I would recommend, strongly recommend you do the native mode. It is amazing. You've never seen Java run that fast. But yeah, Quarkus brings a lot to the table on its own. I mean, you look through some of their PRs, 
you can have see them chewing some guys out. I mean, not necessarily chewing them out, but saying, oh no, dude, when you build with your extension, like you're contributing an extension, like it bulks up the, uh, the jar size to a certain, to this number, you need to go look at it again and figure out how you can trim some things off of it. I hope that answered your question. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sunday, are you okay with starting a few minutes early? Yeah, if there are no other questions. Yeah, so usually what we've been doing is having a discussion afterwards. So, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and have you present and then we'll have some time to ask you both questions after, if that's okay. Sure. I'm here right. for it. You're cool. up. Um, so before I share my screen, uh, quick question. Um, is anyone here familiar with Elixir on any, in any capacity? I've literally been to one presentation where I watched someone describe it. That was it. Okay. Uh, what about Erlang? It's the Little same bit? presentation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, how about Ruby? Okay, cool. I, I so programmed just, uh, in the Ruby, yes. So, sorry, can you say that one again? Uh, I, I said I, I programmed in Ruby. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm familiar with Ruby. Okay, cool. So um, that gives me a little bit of a, a good understanding of where we're starting from. Um, I personally give this talk from the perspective of a JavaScript engineer who's moving into Elixir, but I will try to make it a little broader, although the code examples are JavaScript-y. Um, but we'll go ahead and share. So welcome to Intro to Elixir um, from a JavaScript dev background. Um, I'm Sundi. Uh, so I am an Elixir dev and a JavaScript dev. I'm also an emoji enthusiast. If you were here earlier, we talked about it. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I'm currently on the job market. So uh, just shout that out there. Uh, so um, I have highlighted on the left, um, just like a quick overview of what we're going to be looking at. Um, the history of Elixir, um, kind of the stack that Elixir uh, programs are work, uh, work with. Um, and some of my favorite Elixir features, because I, I know that when we're starting out as engineers, sometimes we just want to see what the fun toys are in a language, uh, rather than, you know, maybe doing the whole tutorial and getting through all the things. So we'll go through that. And then um, I talk a little bit about uh, Phoenix Live View, which is like the new hotness in Elixir land, um, and some of the education resources that I personally benefited from while I was learning. So. Um, Elixir is a functional programming language, so we covered a little bit of object-oriented uh, just now and moving in functional. Um, it was built off of some of the really awesome features of Erlang that were um, really built up in the 80s around um, communication, uh, phone, telephone lines, um, and those kind of connections that are made um, to create distributed and fault-tolerant applications. Um, you really see them for real-time communication. Um, there was actually a test where, uh, like four years ago or so, you could actually open up one WebSocket connection um, in, an, in an Elixir environment and run one million um, connections across it. And you could send one message to one million connections and they, the latency was not really bad. It was just like maybe a second or two uh, for one million. Um, of course, you can spread that across multiple connections. No one needs to put that over one, but that's like the big, that was the big bragging point for the guy who created the, the channels feature, but we'll get into that. Um, so some notable names, PagerDuty, Discord, Pinterest. Um, there are a lot, um, there are a lot more, um, but these are like some of the biggest ones that I could kind of pull up uh, for who's using Elixir. Um, people say that not a lot of people are using Elixir production. That's true and not true. You just kind of have to find them. Um, personally, like in the DC area. Um, I used to work at one of the like five Elixir shops in the area. So it's, it's niche, but hopefully we're growing and hopefully I'm giving some information on it that might help you guys make a decision if you want to bring it into your ecosystems or not. So um, the history. Uh, so Elixir was founded um, about eight years ago by a guy named Jose Valim. Um, he really liked the, the best parts of Erlang, the best parts of Ruby, um, and didn't think that any particular language had it all. So as any engineer does, 
uh, when they don't have something they want, they go make it, right? Um, so he went ahead and, you know, built out Elixir. Uh, I'm certainly sugarcoating and, and glazing over the whole story of like how he created this. But in general, he wanted to come up with a way to solve for concurrency in a way that he hadn't seen before. He wanted it to read well. He wanted it to be functional. Um, and so he picked up a bunch of different um, tidbits of different languages, which is why, I'm at, why I asked at the beginning um, how people or if people have interacted with these other languages before, because he really did pick out little pieces of different languages to sort of uh, implement that in Elixir, uh, which was really cool. We'll, we'll talk about some of that. The stack, um, a lot of the back end of Elixir apps are written in Elixir. Uh, with a querying language called EXO. Uh, so um, it looks similar to SQL, but really isn't. Um, the best way to say is just like out of the box, you get these three things. You get Elixir, you get Ecto, and you get Phoenix, which is the front end framework that you can use if you'd like um, to show your, your views. So it's kind of the model view controller a little bit, but um, it's probably too simple to describe it that way. Um, so the Phoenix framework, we'll get into that in a little bit as well. Uh, the Phoenix framework is, is the front end portion of the stack. Um, so we'll get right into my favorite Elixir features. Uh, the first one is the IEX session. So um, one issue that I've always had with writing like JavaScript code, particularly in like these interviews that I've been doing, um, I will have to pull up a REPL, wait for it to load, choose JavaScript, um, and then enter all of the necessary mm, fluff in order to make whatever code I need to write work, right? They want me to do a TD, 2D array and I have to like enter it all in and you know, it has to compile in the right everything or the other. Um, the nice thing about the IEX session is if I have Elixir installed on my computer, um, I can go into a terminal, write IEX, hit enter, and I have an Elixir session running. So I can write any kind of Elixir functionality in it it will save it per session. So if I assign a variable, I, maybe I made a list of something and then I want to enumerate over that list, I can save the list to a variable in that session and then work with it. Um, and the powerful part of that is it's not just a sandbox. It can access your project if you are using, if you're running that session in your project. So if I'm in the directory of my application, of my project, and I hit IEX run or whatever the command is, it's IEX mix dash S something um, server. Uh, what I do is I can actually say my app dot module, and then I can say that this is my function. And then I can actually input the parameter that maybe I had just saved. Maybe I just made that list I was just talking about. Um, and I can put it in that function um, and have it run, uh, run the code I actually wrote in my application but abstract it out into a sandbox so then I can play with it and see where my bugs are coming from, right? So I really like doing that. Um, there's a really cool way of inspecting it. Um, it's really good for debugging. Um, and it's honestly what helped me learn Elixir so fast uh, because I didn't have to leave my project to uh, get to know it. Uh, so that was really great for me um, in that regard. Um, pattern matching. Um, if anyone's heard anything about Elixir, they hear pipes and pattern matching. Pattern matching is a really great way of, of making some really clean code. Um, so on the left, I have a JavaScript Fibonacci function um, that calculates the Fibonacci sequence of the number that is input. Um, the function on the left and the function on the right do the same exact thing, um, but the one on the right is written in Elixir uh, and it uses pattern matching. They both use recursion, but they, um, the one on the right uses pattern matching to um, assess the Fibonacci sequence. And so what I like to tell people when I start telling them about pattern matching is that in 2019, in my full prime of Elixir development, I did not write one single if statement, not one. And that is because um, you're able to write your conditionals in a way that's human readable. So uh, how the function on the right is working is you get a number, passed into your function. Um, it, there's a module uh, called fun. And then there, th it looks like three function definitions. It looks like I'm defining a function three times called fib. But what it really is, is I'm defining this function once and I'm declaring an arity of one. So that means there's only one argument. Um, and if that argument is a zero, it returns a zero. 
if the argument is a one, it returns a one. And if it's anything else, it does that third line of code or fourth technically. And this is really useful in production environments when you are looking for certain cases that you, um, you know, you're trying to match against. And that could be the same as number equals 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 zero. And that's infinitely less characters. Um, so much easier to read. Um, I, it's not, Elixir isn't really related to Ruby at all, but I know it reads a little bit like it with the definition. Um, I personally think that if you've written some really good Elixir code, people without any programming knowledge would be able to read it um, and understand what your code is doing. And I think maybe I'm being a little like, I don't know, optimistic, but I think somebody who maybe just knew math would understand that this definition of a Fibonacci sequence um, is actually executing that code. Um, so this is like a, a quick overview of pattern matching. There are many deeper ways of getting into pattern matching, particularly with uh, destructuring code so that you can actually pattern match against modules, you can pattern match against structs, you could pattern match against um, actual values, which is what we're doing here. Um, it can get really deep. Um, but this is one of the ways that is like most commonly seen uh, for definitions. Um, and people will ask me, what's the benefit of writing a function three times? And I would basically ask, what's the, what's the benefit of writing if, else, if, else, if, else, if. Um, so it, it, it basically does the same thing. I just think it's easier to read and honestly to work with and organize code. Um, one way to kind of see how many arguments a function might have to determine that arity is um, the documentation. I actually personally love documentation for um, Elixir docs. Um, they're called hex docs. Um, I personally call all the functions on the left um, like a shopping shelf where I can go shopping for all the different functions as I want to use them. And, you know, maybe the filter is the thing I want, or maybe find is the thing I want. And I actually have a lot of fun playing around with which one is the right one. Um, you can actually, um, going back a few steps, um, go ahead and write, uh, what was that, enum? enum.filter uh, and just hit enter in an IEX session. And it'll tell you all about it, which is exactly what we're looking at here on the screen. Um, so you don't have to leave your terminal session to learn more about the functionality you want to use either, which is really cool. Um, but the documentation is usually up for me at any given time. Um, I'm just referring to it, even if I've read it a few times, it's just easier to see it sometimes. Um, and yeah, so the document documentation is great for, for that particular use case. Um, and then more on arity. So if your functionality is one or argument is only one, um, then it would be represented in your code as a slash one. So how this is good to know or why this is good to know it in this format. Um, sometimes your IEX session will be very informative for you. It's very helpful. And it'll say um, function reverse slash two not found. And you're like reverse slash two, I only passed one argument in. I don't know why it thinks I passed two arguments in. You go back and then you realize that be, oh, I actually was piping um, something. We'll talk about piping in a second, but I actually, was passing two arguments in here. I'm using the wrong version of this function. So if we looked at this Fibonacci function, maybe there was a Fibonacci function that actually took two arguments and it did the wrong thing. It didn't do fib of n minus two plus fib of n minus one. It did, I don't know, fib of n, which wouldn't really help you much. Um, maybe that was arity of two. And so you actually called the exact wrong function. Um, and that is, um, a big deal if you're trying to get your code right. So uh, your IEX session will tell you um, and you would know by the parity uh, notation there. Um, so yeah, I have it documented here is this would be a fib of one. Um, a more real world example of pattern matching. Um, so in Phoenix, um, you have this concept of a handle event. So um, if you are trying to do something with your view and have it react with your controller, um, you might have an event that gets passed back from the client down to the server. Um, and that might be a submit action, or maybe you have a maximum amount of clicks on a button and you know you send back an error called max reached. So um, these 
events or these handle event functions are the same function, but instead of if submit, do some submit function. If else max reached, uh, return me an error, um, and else just return me the socket. Um, you actually have what's what looks like three functions um, kind of doing that same logic. Uh, so this handle event function um, is always arity of three. It takes a submit or it takes a message in the first uh, parameter. The second parameter is metadata that might be click data um, and the socket, which is the connection between the client and the server. Um, and it's usually returning um, an OK socket, which is just a tuple kind of describing the, um, the, the use case of the, or the status of the socket. But in, in any case, this is really just a, a blank example to give you an idea of what the, the parameters might look like. Um, but this is actually really useful for making sure that you are getting what you're expecting. So if this, if you actually did, if you ran your handle event function and you didn't get uh, submit or max reached, you'd land in any message and it would be acting as a catch-all so that your function or your application doesn't just crash um, because it found something it couldn't um, handle. Um, but crashes are good in Elixir um, because you solve the problem that way. Um, this is an Erlang concept, I believe, that um, when your terminal yells at you for, and is all red and says, hey, this didn't work because ARD2, or hey, this didn't work because you didn't handle any message, um, that tells you immediately where your code is missing um, holes. So rather than defensive programming where you say, if it's not this, then do that, and if it's not do this, and you know, like the not, 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 um, you can go ahead and say what you want in the order that you are more specific um, and then go back down to more general. So it falls into an area that you can, you're can you comfortable with. Um, so the ball is always in your court. You're never kind of leaving it up there to uh, figure out what you need to do on your own. Um, and you're never kind of just left with an error message that you maybe weren't planning on handling. So the pipe operator, as I mentioned. Um, so the pipe operator is a way of passing along a function to another function to another function in a very clean and organized manner. So I have a string on the top that's being two lowercase and then split. Um, both of these are not very, uh, very strong examples, but um, let's just say, you know, that's what you wanted and then you got an array of lowercase uh, strings. Um, the code on the bottom is doing the same exact thing. But what's happening here is that the, the string, uh, the sentence, lazy fox or whatever, gets passed into a downcase function. And then the result of that gets passed into the string split function. So what's useful about this is imagine you have a large data set um, and maybe external parameters, and you pass that large data set into a function that's going to transform it uh, with maybe the parameter. That you got. So you pipe that in and then you get an output from that and then maybe you had to write a change set so your model could update and then you pass it in there and then maybe from that you want to broadcast an update to all your various channels so you pass it in there. The, the thing that gets sent from the previous pipe is the first parameter of the next pipe and that is how you um, that's how it works. So whenever you're writing functions, helper functions, to, to use in a pipe uh, format, you always keep in mind that the first parameter is the thing that got passed from above. It's very, very useful. Um, I don't actually recall right this second where the pipe operator came from. I feel like it was closure. Um, but it's very useful for data transformation. And the biggest thing um, that I find that's useful about it is a lot of the time when you're looking at code or debugging it, you don't really care about what's happening to the data unless there's a bug. So if you are looking at it, you usually either care about the thing, like in this case, name, or the result, which is the, in this case, the commented out um, array of strings. Um, and if you were to realize that there, that data wasn't coming back the way you want it to, you can inspect or console log is, I guess, another way of saying it, but you would uh, write an IO inspect in between each pipe operator to actually get the, the value of what each uh, transformation is doing so that you can actually see um, 
what each transformation is doing. And then in that, in that way, you could actually get to the root of where your bug is coming from. So I'm a very visual person. So for me, this is a really great way of breaking down a problem. And for some reason, when it's horizontally going across the screen in a dot function, dot function, dot function, I can't read it. But when it's going down vertically across the screen and it's saying this happened and this happened and this happened, it almost reads to me like a paragraph and it's English readable to me and super helpful for data transformation. Okay, so front end side of things. The Phoenix framework is, um, I think it came out of a company called Dockyard. Um, the, their motto is peace of mind from prototype to production. Um, it looks a lot like HTML with um, not variables, I think the right word is attributes um, mixed in there so that you can get your values um, that got exposed from your Elixir controllers. This is just like a little snippet of what a Phoenix view might look like, um, plain Phoenix. Um, and I, I've heard, I, I don't personally work with it, but I've heard it looks a little bit like Rails. So if you have any experience with that, um, it does reflect that a little bit, um, which isn't surprising considering the people who created Phoenix were originally Ruby and Rails shop. Um, so I did say at the beginning that one of the biggest um, features of Elixir that people love um, has to do with the concurrency aspect and the, uh, the ability to communicate over a large scale. Um, that's made possible through sockets and channels. So um, a Phoenix socket um, would be used to establish a connection um, between the client side and the server. The channels is the method in which you can do that with and create a pub sub layer to actually post and receive real time communications. Um, and you can do that by sending that message. So in that little code example on the bottom right hand corner, um, it's a little bit like that handle event function. Um, where that first message, that new message, was that message input that we were kind of matching on before, um, and the socket is being returned. Um, the no reply, excuse me, the no reply is an atom um, that would say, you know, I don't need to do anything with this, but I'm returning to you the socket. Um, and there is always a broadcast functionality to update your client to let them know that something changed, or this is the update, or here's the message, here's the ID, here's the body or whatever. Um, for me personally, uh, the use case for me with broadcasting was um, broadcasting application updates. So um, if somebody checked out on their phone and they bought a Kava bowl, um, your phone would actually go ahead and say, oh yes, I have, I'm ready. My, my bowl is gonna be ready in 15 minutes. So that was sort of the work that the, the Phoenix channels did for us there. Um, So, like I said, the newest hotness with Phoenix is LiveView. Um, LiveView is the Elixir engineer's solution to never having to write JavaScript again. And that was primarily the motivation to writing it, as far as I understand. Um, it is the answer to React. Uh, it's the Elixir version of the React kind of ecosystem. So, um, to, to, the traditional setup for how an Elixir app might have been written before was um, that you had your browser client, it interfaced with React or Vue or Angular or just vanilla JavaScript. It would send an Ajax request over to your Elixir server and it would send a JSON response back and interpret that over time going back and forth, uh, which can be lengthy, can be expensive, and it is always heavy. Um, the way the Phoenix version works, um, and these, uh, these examples are from the Pragmatic Studios course on Phoenix Live View. Uh, I did not do these animations. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so the way this works is those WebSocket connections that I was just talking about, um, they get opened up between your client and your server. And whenever anything happens on your client, it connects, it, it updates in that message format. Uh, so a click could have been a message, a submit might have been a message. So we talked about that a few times. Um, it goes through the server and it goes back with an update uh, with the updated piece of information and it only updates that piece of information. So it actually knows which part got updated and it renders that specific thing. Um, LiveView was officially released, I feel like 
mm, spring of 2019. I think everyone kind of rushed him though. He was like, he announced it at an Elixir conference and everyone was like, wait, I need this now. And he was like, but I'm not done. Oh, well, I guess I announced it though. Here you go. So there was like a beta version. People were playing with it. Um, people are pretty familiar with it now. I don't personally know of any live view applications in production, um, but honestly, I've seen some really crazy stuff that he's done with it so far. Um, the creator, I mean, um, and I'm excited to see what people are coming out with now. Uh, unfortunately, no Elixir conferences are, you know, happening in person. So we can't, you know, kind of do that showcasing in the way that we normally do. But um, it, it does feel like the community is really uh, moving towards this. So it's really fun. Um, education resources, uh, as I promised. So there was a great YouTube video on the origins of Erlang and how the programming language for Erlang came to be. It's not Elixir, but Elixir was built on Erlang. And a lot of the concepts they talk about in this video were very, very key to how I understood Elixir. Um, I actually just happened to learn all of those concepts before I watched that video. Then I watched the video and said, wow, two weeks of my time was in one video. I should have just watched that two weeks ago. Cool. Um, the build a real-time Twitter clone in 15 minutes is the, one of the things that I said that the creator, uh, Chris McCord of the Phoenix Framework, he, um, he put this out on YouTube a few months ago. Uh, it's an 18 or yeah, 17 minute video where he does this all, this crazy Twitter clone. It's super fast and he has really made Phoenix run so fast that all you have to do is run one command line to create an Elixir project. It's like mix Phoenix new, dash dash live and you have a whole project uh, and you can like auto generate all of the modules you need to create a Twitter clone or a blog or anything that has a natural pub sub uh, functionality in like no time at all and basically all you've got to worry about after that is deploying. Um, if you are, are interested in Elixir and you want to bring it to your company, uh, why we've adopted Elixir is a really good talk on um, a, I believe it was a company in uh, London that was trying to move to Elixir and then this was how they successfully convinced their peers and their higher ups that this is um, a language that they wanted to move into. And then Elixir the documentary was just a really good one to hear about the foundation and like why Jose built this language and much more details in my 10 second overview. Um, I also have a list of books and websites that I really recommend. Um, I personally am not a book person where I read a programming book cover to cover. I actually just keep them on hand to reference them. Um, although I would 100% read your book. I, uh, I had it cover to cover, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> um, these are some books that were very helpful for me when I was learning. Um, ElixirCast is a really good website to learn a lot of the Phoenix nuances. I learned a lot about Phoenix channels through that. Pragmatic Studio currently has a course on LiveView, which is super useful. Um, and Graxio Learning is pretty special to me. Um, if anyone here has read Seven Languages in Seven Weeks, I think is the title. Um, it's by Bruce Tate. Um, Bruce Tate has this company, Graxio Learning, um, that does small training courses where four to six people would be in a two to three day class um, and they would be learning. Um, he has different classes at different times, but I took the live view class. There's also a class on OTP. Um, and I think there's one on more Elixir backend concepts as well. Um, that was really great for me personally. Um, I did his training at a conference, which was super helpful in me getting started in Elixir, but I also did a training course on live view which helped me learn a lot more about live view as it has become more fleshed out and there are more updates uh, coming out with it um, if you'd like to hear me talk more about elixir i was recently on a smart logic podcast called elixir wizards i talk about architecture i talk more about emojis if you're curious if you want to know more about them um, and they asked me a lot of questions about my instagram but that was just very random it's a very fun podcast um, it's really just like talking amongst friends uh, so you can check that out if you're interested in hearing more Elixir stuff from me. Um, and again, I'm hireable. So, hi. Um, and thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Who wants to start? Anybody got questions? I have a bunch of questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So I'm always fascinated by these languages that are hyper uh, throughput aware. What's Elixir's secret sauce? So for example, Rust is, you know, immutable, no locking, and that's how it gets all the throughput. What's Elixir's secret sauce? Well, how is it able to, you know, shoot, uh, broadcast a million destinations through a single pipe? I think that, um, I think that's two different questions. Um, mm. The second one, um, Erlang was built uh, on the telecommunications um, concept that if mm. one thing goes down, the rest of them can't go down. And so mm. um, that is sort of why that open connection uh, um, happens and why that works better. That mm. first video I talked about, Erlang, um, mm -hmm. by the computer file, right. um, that one was really good at explaining that one um, mm. as to why that works. but. Um, I guess building on that, the reason, or Elixir's secret sauce, I think, is that it's very reliable. Um, I never really worried about my application going down because it was going to go down. Um, mm. It was always an external, like, oh, this uh, vendor, you know, produced a new error code that we weren't handling, or our provider is down, or something else, or being maybe we're getting too much traffic, but that, I mean, that wasn't really a thing. Um, Elixir is just a very dependable language um, because of the OTP. So it's mm. a very top down kind of concept. This is a more advanced Elixir concept, but mm. the idea is that there is a supervisor that kicks off the entire application and then it runs gen servers, which are like mm. workers. And mm. if a gen server, like several layers down, is producing bad error messages, it'll mm. tell its parent, hey, I'm not getting what I need. I'm not working. I'm going to shut mm. down now. And if mm. that bubbles all the way up, then your mm. application will crash. But usually Elixir is built and you build Elixir in the way that it handles itself as it goes up. So it's really not going to crash from that top level. So basically a mini Kubernetes or Kate's world. Uh, in Alexa, I've heard it compared totally. like that, yeah. So does it, is it like a general purpose language or purpose built for specific use cases? I... I, I'd like to think you could use it for most things, um, mm. personally, but it is a functional language. I think there are certain places where it maybe isn't helpful, um, mm. but people are proving me wrong. I always use like uh, high level video games as maybe a place where you wouldn't want to write, write it in that language. Um, but then I heard recently that somebody was building a video game with it. So I, I don't know. They just, one day we'll try it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and then on Phoenix, I saw the diagram there, which you said came straight from the Phoenix guys. They're just demonstrating WebSockets are already a thing, and you don't have to use Ajax if you don't want to between any. So I guess what is the value value add of Phoenix? Because I'm looking at it, it ships with a markup language, yet another markup language, and it has WebSockets. I can get both with anything else. Is there a yeah. secret sauce to Phoenix? Or does um, it just integrate well with uh, Elixir? It works well with Elixir. You don't actually have to write an Elixir backend with a Phoenix frontend if you don't want to. Um, oh, okay. It's just, uh, I've never created a Phoenix, or an Elixir project without Phoenix attached. I'm mm. trying to even think of what the command looks like without it. Mm. <laughs> and it's not coming <laughs> okay. to mind. I, I'm assuming I take away the PHX, which stands for Phoenix. Um, but yeah, so I, I think the, yeah, you're right. Um, you, you can usually do whatever you really need to with it. I think the reason it's useful um, is most people don't have connections that fast. Mm. Um, and I, I personally found it useful when um, trying to communicate amongst a lot of different places and mm -hmm. doing um, one broadcast mm. for them all um, mm -hmm. made it so much easier than kind of having to play whack-a-mole and remember where everything needed to be and update every single client Nerd. that needed to know um, one channel updating mm -hmm. them all was like mm -hmm. super useful. All right. Thank you. This, it sounds awesome, especially on the communications part. I have been, you know, debating whether to pick up Rust or, or Go. Or I think Elixir is uh, maybe just pick up Erlang because I'm very intrigued about these uh, non-blocking high throughput platforms. So, yeah, yeah. I, awesome. I went to a talk on um, the uh, Rocket Mortgage when they mm -hmm. rolled out. They rolled out at as a Super Bowl commercial, huh. and the team that had to build some part of the 
pricing or something. I don't know. Some, one of the high volume pieces, uh-huh. um, they, yeah, everybody in the company was up against, Hey, we're, we're rolling out a Super Bowl commercial. When that commercial rolls, we're expecting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to visit and this will be our debut. Mm. Um, and they wrote, uh, one of the pieces that did did a lot of the uh, orchestration stuff in Erlang because, mm. well, they had been playing with it. They had like 20% time at that company mm. at Quicken Loans and they, mm. people had picked up on Erlang and said, hey, this looks cool. We ought to file it away. And at some point we may need to know this. Mm. Um, but all the things that Sunday was talking about, the the you know high availability, the, the fault tolerance, the fact it was mm. built for communica- uh, communications industry where, you know, right. They're, they're looking at five nines, six nines, not right, four nines, right. two nines, one nine. Right. Um, yeah. All of that went into it. And they were talking about, you know, they just, their throughput was fantastic. They, you know, obviously they learned more as they built it out, but mm. there were no problems in that piece that they wrote in Erlang and they were really happy with their choice. Right. And I think the, from what I understand and, and just hearing you repeat it, Sunday, the, the Elixir piece is really, you know, the special sauce you were talking about is is yes. the the pub Erlang. sub it's, it's, right mm-hmm. it's really it's really the the pub sub idea if you're going to do pub sub in erlang you you may want to just go ahead and use elixir because the framework's already there for you yeah, yeah. i'm definitely going to check it out it's i i'm uh, i'm like i said i've i've been want, i've been debating which language which of these non-blocking high throughput languages to pick up and uh yeah, yeah. elixir slash erlang they, they look like strong contenders I think the best use case scenario I've heard for it so far that I'm hoping to get the people who who put this together um, talking at an Elixir meetup um, was a large media company who mm. is preparing for election results in November. Um, they did prototype um, projects in mm. Node, in Elixir, and one other language. I, oh, I didn't hear that what the third contender was. They did like a little mini internal competition to see which one was the most reactive, which one updated the fastest. And I was having this conversation with them during an interview, of course. Um, and that's the only way I talk to anyone these days. Um, <laughs> and they were telling me that that team that did the Elixir stuff, like they were super passionate about it. Um, mm. It actually performed the best. And I still went with Node because they had more Node engineers. And I was just like, that's yeah. not. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, that's the realities of business, right? You don't want to get yeah. into a platform that you can hire only two people in the entire mm-hmm. DC metro area for. So. Yeah. I mean, it's not hard. I think <laughs> they would have had a better time on election day than, than I don't know, maybe the pains of having to learn Elixir or find Elixir devs, which is possible. Um, mm. would have been less than the pains they will feel on Elixir, uh, on election, election day. day. You said, you said there's a meetup, right? I mean, you, you, if there's meetups around for it, then there, there is a, actually an ecosystem. And, there is, yes, but we have been more virtual recently and I've had call-ins from everywhere from Tennessee to Brazil. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. Well, and obviously a lot of companies that weren't thinking that they could do virtual, could do mm. remote are now finding out that, they have to, regardless of whether they thought they could or not. And yeah. so, you know, maybe that expands. So some of these niche languages or, or, or frameworks and stuff, they really can spread out a lot more because now you're not looking, you know, in the DC area for an Elixir programmer or for a team of Elixir programmers, you're just looking for, you yeah, know, Elixir, Elixir programmer. programmers. <laughs> yes, exactly. I will say the one caveat is that learning it was not the easiest thing to do on my own because I don't feel that there are a lot of great introduction um, resources out there, beginner resources. Um, I actually would really like to turn this talk into like a template for something a little more, uh, maybe an ebook or something like that uh, to give more to the community because I personally just had such a hard time. I had five weeks before I started at Kava and I was just sitting around, I think it was Christmas. And I, I actually took a five-week Christmas break for the first time since college uh, instead of learning how to code Elixir because I just couldn't find anything on how to get started. Um, everything was like the first book, you opened it to the first page and it said intermediate concepts. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's not too helpful. Um, so I will say it can be difficult. I was really lucky. I was able to learn on the job. I had really good mentors at, at my work and um, they sent me to a conference where I took Bruce, Tra- 
Bruce Tate's training first thing. Uh, and that was only eight weeks in. So he got me pretty early. Uh, I hadn't totally corrupted my knowledge um, uh, from the beginning. So it can be, it can be difficult, but I think companies that embrace it will have a lot less headache, a lot less production issue. Um, and certainly their election results would be coming in on time. <laughs> So, um, Tayo, a lot of the things you said about, uh, about Quarkus were that a lot of the documentation was not written for beginners and. Yeah, I think it's a blind time. spot. Yeah, I think it's a blind spot. And just, I completely empathize with Sundi. These guys are, so they are, they're, I am technically the first like mainstream book coming out Quarkus. Someone wrote something for Pact. Was it was right, rather like kind of like a Cliff Notes. The only, but all told, the only other people that have written or planned. So there's another book on Quarkus coming out uh, in September. The only other people that have written anything on Quarkus are Red Hat staff, literally the people working on the project. So their proximity to this stuff, they just gloss over. It. I was just you know goofing off on Reddit last week. And this came up, you know, people were talking about Quarkus on the Java subreddit. And the first thing they said is like, the reason why they wouldn't touch it is because no introductions to CDI, no introduction to JAX-RS, no introduction to Java EE, which is counterproductive because you're trying to woo these people off of, uh, from the Spring framework and all that. You should cater to their, uh, to their needs a little bit more delicately. But you look at the documentation, you know, and also, it's rather young. Uh, Quarkus is 1.6 now. So I imagine as they go along, they will refine this stuff. But uh, right now, you know, and the documentation isn't bad. Like, if you come in with a Java EE background, you can go straight to town and start writing. If you're coming from a pure Spring framework background, you might not have so, as, good as, uh, as good a time uh, as others. So, yeah. Well. I have to admit, as a trend, though, and some of the newer things I've adopted and picked up, uh, that's been a running theme. Like, mm. the documentation is just not there. And it, it, it's not just Quarkus. Uh, you know, when I first started with Lambda, right? Mm. I mean, that was, there were, there were a lot of unwritten things that I had <laughs> to uh, figure out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure that that is a, uh, I don't know. It seems to be a trend to me. I'm, I'm not, I, I yeah. think that's interesting. It's what happens when you let nerds write. Yeah. <laughs> you have to teach people. <laughs> well, plus they, they just, don't like, they don't like writing generally, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. People sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's just lately, I, uh, you know, as I've been doing over the last four to five years, I've done a lot more like, you know, authoring aside of blogging for Bildung and, you know, having to write so many answers of Stack Overflow, which if you know Stack Overflow, they are not forgiving. You know, people will drive by down vote you if you aren't breaking down every last thought process that led to your answer. So I've acquired a little bit of a sensitivity to good instructional material that sometimes when I see bad duck, I'm like, ooh, you know, you skipped a couple of steps there, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... It's an acquired taste, but no, Quarkus is a solid framework. And I started writing the book when it was 1.0 and ev the book is due out next month, mid next month. And I've had to update for every single version. It's been aggressively developed. They are very, very like, they're very mission driven. They're very focused. So uh, I'm sure they'll get around to this documentation thing a bit. Every now and then I go check their PRs and I see, you know, PRs are a purely documentation update. So they're not taking it for granted that they need to write documentation. They just, you know, that proximity to the technology. I mean, it's Red Hat. They gave us Seam that became CDI. So it's not just something that would occur to them like, wait, people don't know CDI? Huh. Weird. So, yeah. Um, so Randall, welcome. You got in. Sorry, I didn't see your message earlier. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us who you are? 
Yeah, sorry, I didn't realize the concept of it being virtual. I didn't realize I'd actually have to RCP and then when I when I uh, try to get in and was saying it was happening. But uh, yeah, a little bit about me, um, software developer, uh, more in the across the node.net uh, Java space as far as rest. And then um, I really focus on a lot of front end frameworks now. Um, I work with, I guess a bunch of, uh, I work with a lot of full stack developers but you know really gravitating to uh better understanding of the the front end of, the, of things i think a lot of people are full stack but i think for them for the front end the full stack is just understanding html and css and not really <laughs> taking advantage of the uh framework beyond how do i speed things up well, you know what are the best practices from that perspective which um you know, that's the client side of things. If that thing is off by half a second, you know, you could lose, you know, almost half your viewership. So I spent the last few years focusing on that piece. I've been in the tech industry for 18 years now professionally. So um, I'm learning something new every day. Uh, I learned a lot today. And I think just hearing about a lot of these new products, it just reminds me of um, a lot of stuff in the early days that, um, you know, that are popular now. It's just, like you said, it's not a problem of, it's a problem of documentation, which developers hate. And, you know, it's that typical, I build a product, they will come and the marketing piece is the part that falls flat. Like the documentation and how it's presented is the marketing part. But at the same time, it gives an opportunity for one of these, you know, a cloud gurus or one of these guys to really create something around it. Um, I think the hardest thing for some of the texts I'm hearing is just really giving people a good idea of what are some example products that could be created from them right off the bat and what the um, financial, the finances would look like. Because at the end of the day, the guys who make a decision, if they realize that, hey, we're talking about X amount of money saved or X, you know, that's really when they then force all the developers to learn something. Um, you know, it's all about the dollars at the end of the day. So as I'm watching, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, what is that use case? What is the optimal use case? What are, you know, the things, you know, that people could want to build that would take advantage of the full spectrum of the technology and not just kind of using it just to use it. And, you know, that's, that's, that's a little bit of still what I'm asking myself, like, where would I use this? What, what are the perfect tools for this? And, um, you know, even what are some products out there that are being created from scratch that are taking advantage of this that we know of. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Um, any other questions? John, anything from you? No, it was a good discussion. I liked uh, all the presentations. Yeah, I, I will say I was at um, DevNexus, uh, probably the last conference I went to, um, beginning of this year, and they, it's all Java developers. And it seemed that, I don't know, every fourth or fifth talk was something to do with, with uh, Graal VM. Uh, and I knew there were a bunch uh, that brought up Quarkus, not a lot that talked about them or that were focused on them, but they, they mentioned it as a, you know, a framework on top of it. Um, so I heard the term a lot, but I hadn't seen anything on it. So thank you very much. Yeah, and it's quite the game changer. Uh, and the thing is, and what's impressive about Quarkus is it's not the first of its kind. Uh, Heladon has been on the market longer. Micronox has been on the market longer, but they don't have the spread, the ecosystem or the support to back it up. So that's why Quarkus is, like really shooting Graal VM into the uh, into the ether, so yeah. pretty stoked about it. Yep. And uh, Sunday, like I said, I had seen one talk on Elixir and Erlang, so this was really good. So thank you very much. I got a lot out of yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. I hope right. it was overviewy enough. <laughs> <laughs>
but it was good. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. You get a good flavor. You just, you know, just with some of the code examples, you kind of do get a good flavor of, okay, I kind of see what this is about or the type of code I'd be writing and the stuff I need to know about. Yeah. Um, so very good. So thank you both. Um, if there are no more questions, I'll go ahead and close it down. Uh, but do want to plug, we do have another meetup or we're trying to meet up on the, uh, on a regular cadence. So we've been doing the, uh, the Wednesday, the, the, I guess, fourth Wednesday, third Wednesday, however it works out of the month. So next month, uh, that is August 26th, we're doing um, a talk by Scott Ford from Corgi Bytes. He's doing a talk on a deep dive into measuring dependency freshness with Libyear. And then um, we have another talk by um, Valerie Willard from Heroku. And she's talking code and fear, talent, art, and software development. Um, Ooh, that so, fun. Yeah, so uh, both of them are uh, uh, local that did uh, do a lot of like the dev DevOps days and, and, uh, and uh, Agile DC and those. I've met both of them actually at, at conferences before. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, Scott uh, specializes in dealing with legacy code. That's what Corgi Bytes, his, his company, is all about. Um, and uh, and then and Valerie is uh, Ruby on Rails, um, you know, working in Heroku. And uh, yeah, and she uh, she's doing, well, she has a lot of different things, but obviously, you know, talking about um, different different ways of programming and 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 some of the uh, uh, philosophy or psychology behind it, I guess. So that'll be next month, August twenty sixth. Um, I guess that's it. Awesome. So thank you very thank much. You very much. I feel bad now if I'm going to hang up and Joshua just joining, literally not even connected <laughs> to audio. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's my, that's my buddy. Don't oh, worry okay. about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell him he t you told us to hang up on him. Yeah, we'll do. <laughs> Wait till he gets connected just so I can say yeah. goodbye. But all right. Well, I, thank uh, you. I'd love to reach out about uh, your experience writing a book since I'm considering the book route. Love it. And, you know, if you're interested, I could uh, connect you with my editor and publisher. Like for many of these guys, you can walk in through the front door and say, actually, I pitched <laughs> a press a completely different idea. Just vanilla, you know, microservices with Java, E, Spring, and MicroProfile. They're like, it's a, it's a, I got something else for you. Mm -hmm. like, this, what's a Quarkus? Uh, okay. It's a quirky uh, name. You should have called it Quirky Quarkus. <laughs> I should. There. Trust me. If you think it's quirky, well, you get the book. <laughs> it, it, yeah. <laughs> it gets worse. But yeah, absolutely. Do connect with me. I'm looking forward to it on your LinkedIn. Uh, you can email me, whatever I'm here for. Sounds great. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks Thank a lot you. to uh, Teo and uh, Tayo and uh, Sunday. All right. All right. Hope Thank to you. see you guys Have next month. Bye. 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 Bye.